Dr. Romani, welcome back to Med Circle. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. It's so good to be back. Let's talk about dissociation. I want to start with the definition and then go right into your experience working with clients who've experienced dissociation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so dissociation is sort of a splitting off of the self, right? So it's it's in, it's in it basically a person who's dissociated, it's as though a part of their self almost gets cleaved off and it, it, it becomes separated from the, the sort of the overall sense of self. If you think of our self as this big holistic thing, dissociation to be as a piece of that was taken away. Typically, when we see dissociation, in almost all cases I've ever seen, it's a trauma response. It's often considered to be a protective trauma response, right? As though to, to maintain a regular recollection of the memory or that terrible thing that happened would just be too destabilizing. And it could, it's in part could be sort of an intrapsychic protective mechanism. You have this dissociated part of the self. Now, the person who experiences dissociation may experience a wide variety of phenomena. On. They may sort of set, they may literally experience themselves as different people, like as different entities. They may sort of feel like they're looking in at their life from the outside in. They may feel separated from the world in general, as though the only way I can describe it is imagine looking at the world almost through a gauze, or though as you're walking through it in slow motion. So you feel detached, and I think that detachment is a key element of any kind of dissociation. It has multiple manifestations, but by and large, it is a trauma a response. Is that what you see in your private practice? Yeah, I mean, you have to remember in most outpatient practices, you're not going to see a ton of dissociation. You also remember, again, I'm, I'm a big believer in the continuum. Dissociation is a term that exists on a continuum. At the lowest levels of dissociation, we're not talking about a person who has 27 personalities. We're talking about someone who is almost so detached as though they're almost in denial of parts of themselves. And so that milder level of dissociation is more normative than you'd think. And that's more of what we might see in an outpatient practice. Now, if you go to the most severe levels of dissociation, that's where you'd see dissociative identity disorder. For example, a person having multiple personalities or so dissociated from themselves that they're not even almost aware of what their body, if you will, is doing and what yes. that, that part of them is doing. It's like they get separated in different ways. So there's a continuum of dissociation. It's like, it's almost like the, the sort of milder dissociation that allows some people to get through the day and the extreme dissociation that really can be quite destabilizing. Because I've worked with clients with trauma histories, I've seen certainly people on the milder end of the dissociative spectrum. We tend, we see dissociation as part of post-traumatic stress, complex post-trauma, borderline personality. All of those will carry sort of a, a pretty heavy dissociative element to it. I have also worked with clients who had histories of, you know, DID. So at the most extreme, I've seen that too. It's sort of not my area of specialization. So those are folks where you'd work in tandem with a really trained trauma therapist because that's a very, very specialized area of focus. We'll talk a little bit more about dissociative identity disorder here in a bit. Would someone experience dissociation during or before or after a panic attack? That's an interesting question, Kyle. I, I can, I think the panic attacks, and we always think of panic attacks two ways, right? There's the panic attacks almost everybody's had once, right? Mm -hmm. Panic attacks that can happen when you don't have enough sleep, when you wake up disoriented in a new place, when you're extreme, ex experiencing a lot of stress and experiencing tremendous stress or any of those things. We've all had panic attacks under those conditions, right? And it happens once, and then a person's like, I gotta get my life in order, I'm gonna get more sleep or whatever, or and then and then they don't have any more panic attacks. In panic disorder, a person has panic attacks quite regularly, multiple panic attacks a week. They're spontaneous. You have no idea what will cause them. The person really feels on edge, not knowing when the next will happen. Now, in those cases, some folks will, will report that they can feel a little bit of what we might call a prodrome, like a lead up to that panic attack. And it's quite conceivable that even in the lead up, there's some sense of like something's about to happen. Now, during the panic attack, I have definitely talked with many clients who say, I felt like I was out of my body. Like I was almost watching right, myself right, have this right. like heart attack experience. And, and right. I was, and I didn't understand what was happening, but I really thought I was dying, but I wasn't sure sort of it was me. And then it, obviously when a person comes out of a panic attack, what we see is a lot of exhaustion. And then we almost see more of an integration of, of self. And like I said, the person's often quite exhausted. What's really interested is when a person does have a period of dissociation 
even separate from a panic attack, I've observed this, and again, this is anecdotal in my own clients, when there's a, for example, a tremendous stress comes up, the person has a dissociative moment, even in a session, they will become quite exhausted. It's, so, it's almost exhausting to cleave off part of yourself or switch between identities and come back. So it's, it's fatiguing for the individual. But I think in panic attacks, it's not unusual for some people to feel like the panic attack itself was almost out of body, which would imply dissociation. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through the types now. There are many, but this first one is dissociative mm -hmm. amnesia. Can you explain what this is? So dissociative amnesia is when a person feels as though they simply cannot remember parts of like there's they, they've had a dissociative experience a trauma and then they simply can't remember elements of themselves they just can't remember it like where uh, they were them born, themselves, about yeah. themselves like their history anything like who you know what's your name where are you from don't know i don't remember or they may not remember a specific so part if of somebody went, if somebody was assaulted and they dissociated and then they were getting somebody was asking them what happened they may not have memory of the assault, but they might not even know their own name at this point. Yeah, they might even say, I don't remember anything that happened. Um, you know, and they'll say, you know, you were brought to this hospital with bruises, and they'll say absolutely nothing. And so they may not have memory for that, anything close to that. They won't remember where they were that day, the day before. And this, and this Kyle, is a really important thing to note because something that often comes up, for example, in criminal proceedings, is the dubiousness of a of a, of a crime victim. Well, what do you mean you can't remember? This is a terrible thing. How could you not remember this? This comes up a lot with sexual assault survivors. Dissociative amnesia lets us know that at that period of time, this, for some people, and many people have said this, I felt like I was watching myself be attacked. I was floating above myself. And then some people will have excruciating memories of the situation, but many will say, I don't remember anything. And sadly, this is where policy and mental, mental health knowledge should be driving policy is that well if you don't remember anything and defense attorneys will go at this all the time well then i guess it didn't really happen and you're making this up which a jury's going to buy if they don't understand the landscape of trauma so it's that mm -hmm. that loss of memory that kind of that is that that split off part of the self that doesn't remember so if you want to call the the main personality the person the host this is almost a part of the person that splits off and like they don't remember really significant elements of themselves where they grew up even sometimes it depends on the story correct me if i'm wrong here that does not mean though that they don't experience the effects of the trauma just because you don't remember it in fact they are experiencing the effects of the trauma the dissociation yeah, by not remember Hello? right yeah that's yeah, the exactly. dissociation is the effect you know it's funny kyle i remember um in, in a seminar i was doing a woman um, had talked about how, you know, I know I'm supposed to journal and connect, you know, sort of past to, to, you know, present. She said, I simply have no recollection of my past. And she had a very, very traumatic childhood, very traumatic, massive losses, abuse, inconsistency, chaos. And so it's as though somebody kind of hijacked part of her history. She's like, I just don't have it. In cases like that, Trauma therapies can often be a place where people are sort of, you know, taken to that place where they can see if they can, you know, accurately sort of start piecing it together. But for some people, again, that that area around the trauma gets really carved out. And then we, we experience we see this experience of dissociative amnesia. And like I said, massive policy impacts on this one, because I, I there are big public cases where people are like, well, I guess it didn't happen if you can't remember it. And I'm thinking like, I guess most normal people have not taken a trauma 101 course, because to me, that's what uh, I would expect. All right, let's move to our second type. This is dissociative fugue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. What is this? A fugue is actually a dance. It's a it's a, and a piece of music that goes with said dance, right? So that's that's where that word comes from. In a dissociative fugue, which can actually be quite dangerous, a person wanders away. They just go and people find them sometimes hundreds of miles from home. The person who experienced the dissociative fugue will actually not have a clear recollection of how they ended up in that other place. When they get to that other place, they can often look quite confused, not be able to answer clear, give clear answers to who they are. Sometimes someone will pull their ID and say, okay, let me call someone, but they simply will not have a recollection of how they got there. So it's, it, and, and it's, you can see how that's dangerous, almost like we might 
see in a in a uh, older patient with dementia who, yes. who might wander, right? And um, and that's that can be dangerous, especially depending on weather, um, safety, because they they are sort of kind of wandering. And I mean, they they rec they have their abilities. They might literally get in a car, or get on a bus, or get on a train. So they're going through steps, right? But it's almost like it's robotic or an autopilot kind of a thing. Then they end up someplace, and they're, again, they're confused. And somebody will usually will sort of not usually often will find out that someone's in a dissociative fugue state when somebody's asking them questions and they're recognizing this person's confused. They might think they're actually on drugs. They're not on drugs. They may call someone and then they will get them back to that, you know, get, get them back to safety. Is this a response to recent trauma or is this something the body does occasionally after old trauma or years of trauma? Well, you know, I would say that it's not likely to happen to, after a singular traumatic event, though anything's possible. It could be something we see in response to complex trauma. It's also something we could see in response to a triggering event, right? So a person's experienced a trauma. Now they're in a situation that evokes an original right. trauma. And under that stress, a dissociative fugue could happen. It's an extreme response. It's extraordinarily rare. It is not normative or even at all, you know, it's rare. I have to tell you, in all my years of practice, I have never, ever personally consulted on a case where there's a dissociative fugue. I've read some, like literally, I remember one in particular, a woman was found out in one of the desert cities and, and again, sort of a little disheveled, but more than anything confused. And uh -huh. she'd had a history of trauma and sort of somehow managed to drive her car out and she stopped to get gas. Well, speaking of rare ones, I know this next one is pretty rare, dis dissociative identity yes. disorder. And in fact, on YouTube, I see so many people. Now, look, I don't know if it's real or not, but I can't imagine that something this rare has so many people on camera sharing it. It makes me a little, uh, you know, hmm. What are your thoughts on DID? So DID is an incredibly rare disorder. It stands for dissociative identity disorder. And when we, and it's sort of like the, the kind of the, the prime, I, to me, what I consider sort of, sort of the, the kind of, um, keystone diagnosis within that dissociative sort of chapter within a diagnostic manual. Um, it is very rare. And it's, it's interesting. I was thinking percentage wise, if as many people in the real world had DID as we see in the movies, everyone would be having DID practices, right? Yeah, um, right. I've seen very, very few cases of it. And we always have to entertain competing diagnoses, including personality disorders like borderline personality. In, in borderline personality, you can see some sort of identity shape shifting and liability. And it, it doesn't, it's not quite at the level of a dissociative identity. It's a dissociative experience. And sometimes it's sort of a trauma response. We could see some dissociative patterns in complex post-traumatic stress. It's not unusual to see that there. Certainly we could see dissociative sort of experiences after post-traumatic stress. So when we think of DID, you know, we're, we're looking, there's specific things we're looking for, like these identifiable, what are called alters. Alters are these, these various personalities per, a person possesses. And the alters are often quite distinct and people with DID will, they'll have names, ages, even more than that, ethnicities, identities, you name it. Um, and then the person will find that different stresses may lead them to, you know, that different alters get pulled out and they will notice that under stress. And that's usually what you'll see with people with DID. They have the host identity, right? That's the, that's sort of their, that's them and the, the their, I don't, know, I don't want to say that's them. That's just sort of a primary identity that most people are accustomed to encountering with them. However, if stress comes up, then you'll see that sort of transition into an alter. People with DID will say, listen, the, my, I had this conversation with someone, but clearly it was my alter having this conversation. And so the whole thing deteriorated and the conversation became really strange. And so it, it's very rare. That, that's the bottom line. And for unless it's been formally diagnosed, not only by a licensed mental health practitioner, but one with an expertise in trauma, mm. you know, I would need to see that to be sure. And, and you know, I, I couldn't even tout myself as such. I am a mental health yeah. practitioner, but the level of training in trauma one would need to be able to successfully work with somebody who did not only diagnose them with DID, 
but then successfully work with them. Usually mm. in cases of DID, we see some pretty significant trauma histories. So what you're likely seeing is sort of a complex post-trauma presentation with this more significant kind of manifestation of DID. So it's complicated. And I think that obviously it's not a ubiquitous kind of a pattern. And like I said, I think it's, it's sort of so... It's intriguing, but the way cinema and story present it makes it seem so much more not only common, but also sort of intentional, as though a person feels in charge of all of this, right? Like they're, they're sort of pulling the strings. I'm going to go be my seven-year-old identity. I'm going to go be, it's not, it's, a, it's not, it's something happening to the person. And so, yeah. and it's distressing. It can actually be quite distressing yeah. for the person experiencing it. Very interesting topic. This final one is depersonalization mm -hmm. disorder. So in depersonalization disorder, a person feels as though they've sort of, they're watching their life from the outside, right? So the best example I can say is they're literally sort of feel like they're floating out there watching what's happening to them. They feel as though they're on some sort of like robotic-y, autopilot -y way of going through the world. They feel as though they might be watching life slowed down um, with kind of almost like a gauze or a filter over their face. Depersonalization is a, it's an interesting manifestation because we're going to see it in trauma survivors as though, especially where I've heard and I've, I've witnessed it is people saying they felt depersonalized when they've had sex. So they have a history of sexual abuse survivorship, either from childhood or adulthood, um, or non-consensual sex, um, physically, sexually assaulted, whatever it may be. And they've had these traumatic sexual experiences. Then when they do enter even into a consensual adult sexual relationship, they find themselves depersonalized, like almost leaving their body at those experience at those times, making sex a really fraught space for them. So that's where I've had I've heard clients talk about depersonalization. But Kyle, some people actually use drugs to feel depersonalized, like they'll actually use drugs so they can sort of feel like they're kind of in this uh, out and othered experience watching themselves. Yeah. So there's people who find this to be kind of exploratory. But when we're talking about it from a mental health perspective, once again, it's going to load onto trauma and a person's going to feel as though they're watching themselves and linked to that issue of panic you brought up, you know, that during a panic attack, some people may feel quite depersonalized. And I think in a person with more severe panic disorder, we may see the sort of depersonalization experience. So the depers depersonalization disorder are periods of feeling dissociated, mm -hmm. not, not a time. chronic state of mm -hmm. feeling that way. No. no. And do they have to occur uh, at any frequency in order to get the disorder, disorder diagnosis? I think that what we look for is significant episodes of it that are sort of really substantiated that the person's able to describe that it sort of links to something historic, though you don't have to have the trauma origin to have uh -huh. these diagnoses. I mean, it's just simply you're diagnosing it episodically. I have to tell you off the top of my head, I don't know the period of time or the number of episodes that would be required to meet this diagnosis, though. Okay. Well, we have a fabulous trauma library mm -hmm. that uh, Med Circle members can access. We'll link to that uh, somewhere around this video. Dr. Romney, thank you for your time today. The, the really great stuff in this video, as always. I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for watching. Most importantly, remember, whatever you're going through, you got this. Mm -hmm.